This video was made possible through the support of my patrons. It's time for another trip into the far future with The Sensorites, a six-part story which sees the Doctor, Susan, Ian and Barbara land on a spaceship in orbit around the Sense Sphere in the 28th century. Story editor David Whittaker commissioned writer Peter Richard Newman to put together the script, his only one for the programme. The Sensorites is a serial that isn't often talked about. I wouldn't say it's entirely ignored, but during the first Doctor's era, it's easy for a six-parter like this to get overshadowed by stories like the Daleks, which have much more memorable creatures, or the Aztecs, which has a much larger moral dilemma at its centre. The Sensorites didn't even have the indignity of going missing so that fans could build a mythology around it like Marco Polo. All episodes are freely available to view and there's actually a lot known about its development and production. Does the Sensorites deserve to be glossed over, or can appearances be deceiving, which would be fitting for a story like this? But let me back up. We'll get to the plot in a moment, but but before the Sensorites can start properly, we've got a magnificent opening few minutes. Once you gloss over just how quickly it seems that Barbara has gotten over the events of the last story. I don't know why we ever bothered to leave the ship. Well, you're still thinking about the experiences you had with the Aztecs. No, I've got over that now. Blimey, serialised TV was different back in those days. But after that, we get this wonderful moment where the TARDIS quartet take a moment to consider how far they've come and grown thanks to their adventures. Well, there's one thing about it, Doctor. We're certainly different from when we started out with you. That's funny. Grandfather and I were talking about that just before you came in. How you both <laughs> changed. Oh, we've all changed. Have I? Yes. yes, it all started out as a mild curiosity in the junkyard. Now it's turned out to be quite a, a quite a great spirit of adventure, don't you think? And in the first couple of minutes, we're treated to quite possibly my favourite shot of the whole first season of Doctor Who. Directed by Mervyn Pinfield, making his debut on Doctor Who, we get this incredible 90 second uninterrupted shot which has the character beat we talked about a moment ago, the Doctor reminiscing on meeting Henry VIII, double checking the console readings for outside, and then the group step outside of the TARDIS set onto the set of another spaceship. Then, with a clever cut, the camera has been repositioned outside of the police box as the Doctor instructs Susan to close and lock the door, helping to seal the nature of the TARDIS's dimensions. It's such a brilliant moment and we've not even started the story proper yet. The team have landed on a spaceship orbiting the Scent Sphere. The ship is essentially immobilised, as its limited crew of three have had their minds invaded by the Sensorites on the Sphere below. But the Sensorites often visit it to provide them with food and resources. They're trapped with no idea why. It's a really effective opening mystery, especially when you consider crew member John is locked in the back room because he has completely lost his mind due to the Sensorite influence. We spend the first two and a half episodes entirely on the spaceship, though the TARDIS team don't stay by choice. After reviving the captain, named Maitland, and crew member Carol, who is also John's fiance, the Doctor decides there's nothing to be done to help them, and elects to leave. It's only because there's a Sensorite on board who has managed to remove the TARDIS lock that they're forced to stay. It's a bit mad to see the group elect to leave Maitland and Carol to their fate so quickly. They don't even offer to take them home or somewhere in the TARDIS. The Doctor's just like, oh yeah, not my problem, and tries to leave. It kind of made sense in the keys of Marinus, where the group try to leave Marinus only for Arbiton to hold the TARDIS behind an invisible barrier, but even then it still felt forced. For the Sensorites, it feels like either Peter Newman or David Whittaker were trying to strictly adhere to a formula, no matter how contrived it felt. And while there's a lot to love about these opening two parts, it's definitely trying to engage its audience with atmosphere and dangling plot threads because the logic does fall apart as we learn more about the situation. If the Sensorites are in control of the crew's minds and don't want to harm them, they just want the crew to leave, then why don't they force them to leave? Or if they can't directly influence them, stop everything they do until the crew try to leave their orbit out of their own accord. The big action set piece of part one, entitled Strangers in Space. 
Has the ship being forced on a collision course with the sense sphere only for disaster to be averted by the doctor piloting the ship when the rest of the crew are immobilized? Um, why did the sensorites do that? The doctor and Ian posit that maybe it was part of a game to make them frightened, but that does not gel with what we learn about the species later. If the doctor wasn't there, they would have died. And then at the end of part one, we learn that the sensorites are on their way and are trying to board the ship, but there's already a sensorite on board, right? The one that cut out the TARDIS lock. We never see or hear from that one again, so what is going on here? Is there a secret mystery sensorite on board? Though, to be fair, the cliffhanger that ends part one is terrific and is iconic in the fandom, where a sensorite creepily arrives at the spaceship window, almost akin to the Twilight Zone episode Nightmare at 20,000 Feet, which only broadcast eight months earlier. But I also love the build-up to it. As the sensorite ships encroach, the camera moves in towards Maitland before panning across to the Doctor and Ian with all of the sound muted. genuinely brilliant cliffhanger, especially considering how alien and strange the sensorites themselves look. We learn later that they're generally a peaceful race, but at this moment, they're basically unknowable to the audience and the characters. Also, this is a nitpick, but when they refilmed the cliffhanger for the start of part two, they got the continuity wrong, as Carol is now in the background of the long camera shot. But while the Doctor and Ian are at the front of the ship, the women are sent to the back to cook dinner because it's the 1960s, obviously. There, they find John, played by Stephen Dartnell, whose mind has been utterly broken by the sensorite interference. It's a great two-pronged approach to tension, with the front of the ship being invaded by the sensorites, and the rear of the ship isn't even safe because John is unstable around Susan and Barbara. It's also worth briefly highlighting Susan in this story as well. Despite being the Doctor's granddaughter and making a pretty strong first impression in her first few stories, especially having to face her fears in the irradiated forest on Scarrow in the Daleks, her presence and input since has been incredibly muted, but in the sensorites, she's able to communicate with the species due to the ultra high frequencies on the sense sphere, and because of this, she's able to see their true intent early on and takes the executive order to go away with them as the cliffhanger for part two. So we're two episodes in and we've had two back to back banger cliffhangers. Grandfather, it was the only way, then you I'd agree. Agree? To what? To go down with them to their planet. Otherwise, we'll all be killed. And the idea of Susan having some sort of telekinetic powers, it harkens back to the aspect of the character that made her so affecting when she was first introduced around 30 weeks ago, the unearthly child. However, this decision that she makes is ultimately taken away from her by the Doctor and Ian, because they have no reason to trust the sensorites to hold their end of the bargain. While having Susan be so proactive is refreshing to see, it's a bit of a shame that it's severely undercut by the Doctor, who refuses to let his granddaughter have agency. I'm sure this was meant to read as loving and caring, but honestly, it's a bit uncomfortable and controlling. Because their minds and mine can communicate sometimes, they trust me. Yes, and I assure you, we should make good use of that fact, but not without discussion. You will not make decisions on your own accord. Now, do you understand? Is that quite clear? Well, is it? Look, I'm not saying I'm as clever as you or anything. Of course I'm not. But I won't be pushed aside. I'm not a child anymore, Grandfather. I'm not. Oh, Susan, Susan. Why do you make her unhappy? We can read the misery in her mind. Yes, and it's a good thing you can't read the anger in mine. In all the years my granddaughter and I have been traveling, we have never had an argument. And now you have caused one. All right, Grandfather. 
I'll do as you tell me. It's also a shame that after this, Susan is a spare part for the rest of the serial, except for part six, when she gets this wonderful moment with the Sensorite First Elder about where her and the Doctor come from. Well, grandfather and I don't come from Earth. Oh, it's ages since we've seen our planet. It's quite like Earth. But at night, the sky is a burnt orange, and the leaves on the trees are bright silver. And I'm sure the most attentive of you will have noticed that this speech was referenced in the revived series, in Series 3's Gridlock, when the Tenth Doctor describes Gallifrey to Martha Jones. The sky is a burnt orange. The leaves on the trees were silver. Lovely moment and an increasingly rare one when it comes to Susan's input in these stories. But let's backtrack a bit. Susan's about to get taken away, but the Doctor, observing how the Sensorite's eyes respond to light, realises that darkness completely blinds and disorientates them, and this is how they gain their leverage. While throughout the 1960s, the Doctor Who production team were clearly trying to recapture the popularity and the impact of the Daleks, I don't get the impression that they were trying to do that with the Sensorites. The Sensorites look too deliberately strange and alienating for them to be doing that, with their smooth heads, their strange feet, and how they give everyone the silent treatment early on. Like, it's genuinely creepy when they board the ship and encounter Ian and Barbara, and they just walk towards them without saying or indicating anything. It's a spooky introduction, but the more we learn about them, the more we realise that these aren't exterminators like the Daleks or conquerors like the Vord. In actuality, they're quite weak and demure. They can't deal with the dark, they're super indecisive, which is why the humans were left in orbit for so many months, because the Sensorites had no idea what to do with them, and they crumple when you shout at them. You fool! Grandfather, please! They think you're attacking them. We didn't mean to use sound as a weapon. These aliens aren't inherently good or bad. They have a very rigid society, where a group of elders think and lead, warriors fight, and the Sensorites work and take part in recreation. It looks like quite a peaceful society. Though why the hell they have a disintegrator room makes me wonder just how recently this society became peaceful. What part of the body do you want the beam to strike? In each case, to the heart. Are the hearts of the human creatures on the right or left side of their bodies, or in the center, as in ours? I do not know. Then I will aim the beam at the center of the chest in each case. And yeah, that Sensorite with the black collar is the city administrator, who is apparently so evil that John, the human space traveller with his mind opened up, is able to sense his evilness by just being near him. No, evil is here. He cannot hear you. Your mind is closed by the machine. Your voice is not believed. But let's get back to the plot. So the Sensorites are distrustful of newcomers because 10 years ago, a group of humans visited, discovered that the Sensphere was rich in the element molybdenum, and in an attempt to bring reinforcements back, left the planet in their spaceship, which somehow exploded in the atmosphere. There's also a disease making its way through the Sensorite population, as in the lower rung of society, and the elders have no idea what's causing it. The Doctor starts to gain the Sensorite's trust by attempting to find a cure for the poison, both because Ian accidentally drank some contaminated water and only has days to live, and also because the Sensorites won't give him his TARDIS lock back. Ian drank the water because he was offered water that the non-elders drink, and despite this obvious outlier in the people who get infected by the disease, the elders never figured out that that's where the sickness was coming from. The disease hits all manner of people. Suddenly, without warning. Never the elders? No. These Sensorites, not very bright. They also haven't put two and two together that the disease started showing up as soon as the previous human spaceship exploded in the atmosphere, and they also, also, hadn't realised that their species looks exactly the same, except for the sashes and other markings on their clothing to denote their rank. But let me explain. So the administrator is just so evil that he does not trust the doctor, even though Ian has been poisoned. The doctor even puts together an antidote but the administrator intercepts it and destroys it even though it could help his own people. They say without the antidote the young man will die. 
I say he will live because he is pretending. This will prove it, one way or the other. What the hell is this guy's problem? So the administrator's big plan to seize power is to kidnap the second elder who only wears one sash so he can impersonate him. You see, even though to the audience, the sensorites are of different heights and body shapes and faces, it turns out that from a distance in the show, they're actually meant to be identical. So to them, in universe, they can only be identified through the clothing signifiers, something that the city administrator apparently had never realized before today. Oh, I am sorry, I thought you were one of the scientists. You can see my color of office. I am the city administrator. Yes, I'm sorry, but when your backs are turned, it's very difficult to see. I don't know what we'd all do if you changed your badges and sashes. We wouldn't be able to tell you apart. I have never thought of that. Firstly, I adore that line delivery. Just, just top notch. I have never thought of that. But the reason the sensorites have those sashes in the first place is because they look so similar. So this information that the administrator has just discovered becomes the basis for his entire plan, which he's doing because he's just that evil. 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 But wait a second. The sensorites are telepathic, so how can this disguise even work on a species that can read minds? At one point at the end of part 5, the first elder makes telepathic contact with the second elder who is in captivity. The second elder is unable to reply due to him not having access to a mind transmitter, and the first elder asks why there's no response. He is asking why I don't reply. And then we get to the cliffhanger with the Doctor being stalked by a beast in the depths of the city. And when we return in part 6, the first Elder's loss of contact with the second Elder never gets brought up again. It's not an issue, apparently. Honestly, watching these stories as a marathon might be affecting my judgement somewhat, but it's so bad for the Sensorites to immediately follow the Aztecs, which saw the conflict between the two priests of either knowledge or sacrifice, these two opposing ideologies of this society, it was handled so well there. But here, the conflict between the elders and the administrator is just, it's so simplistic and often baffling. You can argue that Doctor Who is at this point strictly a kid's show, but episodes like the Daleks and the Aztecs, they were not afraid to test the audience and ask big idea moral questions. That's just not here in the Sensorites. I think the administrator also only exists to extend this story to six parts, because believe it or not, he has nothing to do with the disease plaguing the sense sphere. Yes, considering how much time and energy is spent on the administrator, he has nothing to do with this major plot element. And with that in mind, it's so mad just how much of this story is a contrived runaround once it reaches the sense sphere in part 3. A lot of running back and forth under the city to the aqueduct, which is how the poison is making its way to the water, but apparently there's also a monster down there that we can hear. We get a few montages as the Doctor is solving the formula to the antidote, but the audience have no idea how much time has passed, and this vagueness hampers the credibility of the city administrator, because did he take several hours or several days trying to track down the second elder to take his sash? All the while, Jacqueline Hill takes two weeks off for holiday as Barbara spends two episodes staying behind on the human spaceship in orbit. Ian is incapacitated and is delayed from getting the antidote due to the administrator, but... I cannot understand why the second elder did not bring the antidote here. Well, I managed to get some more that's all that really matters. Then, what was the point in having the first batch get destroyed if, structurally in the story, it was that easy to get another? It's it's just it's just a bit dull, where the stakes feel so manufactured, and I get the sense that Peter R. Newman was making a lot of this up as he went along. Which brings us to the ending, because it turns out there is no monster in the aqueduct. The actual villains of the story are 
Three humans who have been hiding under the city the whole time. They were from the first human expedition whose spaceship exploded in the atmosphere. They believed they were at war with the Sensorites, as their minds had been left open, so they were driven mad, like John from earlier. They have been hiding in this underground network for 10 years, and poisoning the water to bring this imagined conflict to an end. Now, I actually love this ending even if the story itself took so many sloppy steps in order to get here. So if there was no monster, then what was making the roaring noises? The Doctor's coat even gets claw marks on it, and it needs to be replaced by a cloak in the story, so there is something down there, right? We will explain later. But the ending itself is really effective, and it does have some real-world inspiration. See, very little was known about Peter R. Newman until the Sensorites DVD release, and we got a great documentary directed by Chris Chapman and hosted by Toby Haydock, where they sought to learn more about this enigmatic writer. Early in his life, Newman tried to join the army before he was of legal age, even skipping school and exchanging clothes with another soldier who turned out to be a deserter. This is a guy who, when he was younger, really, really wanted to do military service. Eventually, he did join legally and was deployed to Burma, and it wasn't what he expected. In fact, it was a horrific enough experience for him that when he came back, he wrote anti-war stories, such as the 1959 Hammer Films production, Yesterday's Enemy, about a group of British soldiers trapped behind enemy lines. The Sensorites specifically is based on Japanese holdout soldiers, who, after the Japanese surrendered in the Second World War in 1945, did not actually believe the war was over, or because of a lack of communication didn't know about the surrender. In fact, the last confirmed soldier who still thought they were fighting the war was Tero Nakamura, who was discovered on the island of Moritai in December 1974, 29 years after the Japanese surrendered World War II, and ten and a half years after the Sensorites was broadcast. It's terrific inspiration for a twist in this story, and the actors do an impeccable job at selling the ten years of isolation, especially John Bailey as the commander. We have a surprise for you. The war with the Sensorites is over. Is that true? Oh, yes. And the planet's ours now, is it? Completely? Completely. Well, this is absolutely wonderful. We nearly lost, you know. I had command of a fine spaceship. Very fine. Two of my men deserted. Pretended they had to go back to Earth to get reinforcements. So you had to blow up your spaceship? Yes. Still, I suppose I'll get another one. I'll be able to afford it now. Planet's very rich, you know. Oh, yes. Molybdenum. Oh. You know about that, do you? You do realize that this war has been fought by me and my men here? Any treasure trove is ours. That's quite understandable, isn't it, Question? And I'm prepared to back that statement up with force, if necessary. Unfortunately for them, the Doctor and Ian take the soldiers outside, and they're immediately arrested by the Sensorites. The First Elder just says the Administrator will be punished, and that's it. I know it's meant to be anticlimactic, but this just feels so hurried after five and a half episodes of build-up. I wish that maybe the reveal of the soldiers had been a cliffhanger ending for the end of part five, and more of an effort had been made to trick them into leaving the caves for the final episode. Instead, it's just wrapped up in a single scene with an explanation of the moral by the Elder. They really believed they were at war with you. At some time, they must have opened their minds or experimented with the mind of transmitters. Every really rational thought was crushed out, and all they had left was the game they played. The game of war. Lord, I'm confused. Is this a happy ending or a sad ending? It's an ending, that's enough! And yeah, that's the end of the serial. The Doctor, Ian, Barbara and Susan depart, they watch Maitland and his crew leave in their ship, the very first time a model spaceship in flight was ever shown in Doctor Who, 
Ian makes a remark about the Doctor not being able to pilot the TARDIS, and the cliffhanger ending has the Doctor threatening to leave Ian at the next place they land. For six episodes that meandered this much, it needed a much stronger resolution. Also, considering how little the Doctor and Ian interacted in this serial, this ending comes right out of nowhere. The contrast between the opening scene of the group reminiscing and feeling proud of how far they've come, and this ending just feels too stark and unjustified. I didn't mean anything. So this you all... think I'm an incompetent old fool, do you? Now, Doctor, I never Since said that. you are so dissatisfied, my boy, you can get off the ship. And the very next place we stop, I shall take you off myself, and that is quite final. Carry on. Now, I do admire the production of this episode. Like I said, the sensorites, I think they look great, and they are memorable, and that's the work of costume designer Daphne Dare and makeup artist Jill Summers. I also think that Raymond Cusick's set design is so clever and striking, taking inspiration from the Basilica Holy Family Church in Spain and its lack of right angles and straight lines, the sensorite city does feel very alien and strange. Like I mentioned before, Mervyn Pinfield's direction is terrific and Frank Cox does a good job as well when he takes over for parts 5 and 6. I find a lot of charm in the whole theatrical style the series is also employing, with characters speaking and monologuing almost directly to the camera. It's antiquated, yes, but there's also real charm to it. But you will do nothing further until I have considered the matter. I shall not wait. We will not be safe until these Earth creatures are dead. How very convenient. Yes, noise and darkness. The two things the sensorites dislike. There's more in this than meets the eye. <laughs> these people have fine qualities. The second elder and I have misjudged them. And I will tell him so. Can't just have your characters announce how they feel? That makes me feel angry! Norman Kay's music does a good job at setting the mood for the first few episodes, which is where the sensorites as a whole peaks. Honestly, once they reach the sense sphere, it's plot contrivance after contrivance, obtuse motivation, and in some cases, it just descends into outright farce. It's so padded and structurally unsound, especially following the Aztecs, which dealt with the dual nature of society and trying to earn the trust of the right side significantly better, and in just four episodes, no less, instead of a laborious six. But the Sensorites is still written from a good place, with great real-life inspiration and anti-war sentiments, and also there's some terrific material for William Hartnell's Doctor. He and everyone else are flubbing their lines left, right, and centre, but when he's on fire, he's on fire. Now listen to me, both of you. You've taken the lock of my ship and I want it returned immediately. You're in no position to threaten us. I don't make threats. But I do keep promises. Also, this serial has had a lasting impact in the Doctor Who universe, with the Sensorites having spiritual successors in the show's revival. In Series 2's The Impossible Planet, we meet a subservient, telepathic species called the Ood, whose showrunner, Russell T. Davis, created to resemble the Sensorites. They even confirm in Series 4's Planet of the Ood that the Ood come from the same star system as the Sensorites. I've been to this solar system before, years ago. Ages. Close to the planet's sense sphere. But now that we've wrapped up with this story, we now make our way to the finale of Doctor Who's first season. Will the Doctor make good on his promise to kick Ian out of the ship? Do we have another home run Doctor Who historical? And can our heroes survive one of the bloodiest years of the French Revolution? Let's find out next time as we watch The Reign of Terror. I'll see you next time. Hey folks, thanks so much for joining me for this review of The Sensorites. I hope you enjoyed it. I had a really fun time putting this one together. And if you folks are thinking, yes, that was a great review, how can I support the Mr. Tardis YouTube channel? Well, firstly, you can hit that like button. You can also subscribe to keep up to date with all future Doctor Who reviews and videos that I do. But did you folks ever consider that I also have a Patreon? I have never thought of that. 
These names that you can see scrolling down are my incredibly handsome and beautiful patrons, and I'd like to give a shout out to these particular patrons. Adam Gratton, Angus Bajanison, Callum Baird, Chiba City Blues, Dan the Dreamer Shill, Daniel Davis, Darkstar2189, Darren Carver Bowsiger, Dean Jones, Dr. Hadley, Dragonbugs, Dylan Whitaker, Evil Dalek79, Finley Rude, Flipseed, Ginger Animator, Hunter Graham, Jack D. Evans, James Ivory, Jared Saylor, Joseph Adams, Leela, Maria Bergman, Mario Fanboy15, Matthew Perry, Michael Serrano, Miranda Logan, Nate Harris, Palex, Pat Andrews, Randall Sprinkle, Raven Woods, Reese Lloyd, Ross, Ryan Duncan, Samuel Whitaker, Scott Gerrard, Taylor Wooderson, The Brit Sniper, The Doctor 14 Blu-ray Reviews, Timbo1834, Toby Loxton, Will, Zabi555, and Strange Folk. Thanks so much to all of my wonderful patrons who helped to keep the lights on here on the Mr. Tardis channel. Go in the link in the description to check out how you can become a patron as well. And folks, I'll see you all next time.